Good morning. Welcome to our 10th out of 10 and final panel in our 2017-2018 University Colloquium series, We Have Ag. And though this is our 10th in the series, I think it's the first one this year where we don't have snow. <clears throat> uh, in, in university student fashion, uh, we see many students in flip-flops and shorts and tank tops and everything already this morning. So, um, My name is Marilyn Wells and I'm the Provost and Senior Vice President for Academic Affairs here at the university. And it's my honor to welcome you this morning. Uh, throughout the year, uh, we have touched on a wide array of topics in our series, many of them dealing with stewarding our natural, natural resources, water quality, we've looked at technology and food. Uh, we're in cooperation with the Minnesota Pork Producers Association. We had a really cool speaker come in from the, from the Netherlands to talk about cultured meat along with one of our faculty. Uh, we've looked at uh, organic and conventional farming. We've looked at the history, present, and future of farming. Uh, we've looked at um, new farms for new Americans, where we've touched issues of diversity, new Americans, immigrants, and refugees, and their important role in farming today. Uh, we've looked at, again, water quality. And last week, we looked at young professionals and some of the really neat things that the, I'll take the liberty and say, of under 35 that are are doing in farming, either carrying the legacy of a family farm or being first generation farmers. We've had approximately 35 panelists and well over 500 participants um, here in the auditorium. We also have all of our series that are live streamed and the videos from each of those are parked on the website that if you missed one and you want to go back and see it or you want to I hear another speaker, again, you can do that. Um, I would like to thank the many people throughout the year who have been very helpful in suggesting themes, speakers, and particular panelists. And we have some of you here in the audience today, um, such as Lori Stevemer, who's been very helpful um, in that regard. We very much appreciate that. So today, when we were planning the series out in early fall and etching out all the themes, this was our wild card one, the hot topics, to be able to present uh, topics that we hadn't yet thought of or things that arose throughout the year that we wanted to delve into a little more. So today, we have uh, five panelists, and we are going to be touching on a variety of topics from trade, mental health, the opioid epidemic, sustainable farming, and dairy farming today uh, to touch on those. Uh, we, as always, we want to be sure to leave adequate time at the end for discussion, questions, and answers. And I'm particularly thrilled that I could say throughout the entire year, we've never ended early due to lack of discussion or questions or thoughts or ideas, which is really one of the uh, most meaningful parts of, of this series uh, that we set out to showcase um, our areas of distinction in food, ag, and um, natural resources across our academic programs, our research, and our community and industry partnerships. And we have gained a lot of ideas about the next steps and where we will go as a university. So without further ado, uh, let me introduce our first panelist today. We have five, so we want to allow ample time for them. Uh, we're very fortunate to have Dave Preisler, who's CEO of Minnesota Pork Board and also involved with the Minnesota Pork Producers Association and serves on their International Marketing Committee. Um, I also learned this morning that uh, Dave's wife is a twice alum of ours, most recently of our doctoral program in Ed Leadership and is a superintendent, and they met as school teachers um, years ago. Um, and so he's going to share what, much with us about trade and exports, which as we all know, if you watch the media for about five minutes to these days, you know that the trade and exports around pork and agriculture is a very, very pressing topic, and one that's changing from morning to afternoon as we watch social media. So Dave, let me turn it over to you. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the invitation. I uh, pre appreciate the time to spend uh, with you a little bit. And uh, I think we're just going to jump right into it. And I know we all got orders to kind of only do eight to ten minutes and then uh, keep
keep the time for questions. I will guarantee you I can get into very little detail on trade in eight to 10 minutes. Um, although the president does a lot on trade with a tweet. And uh, so we'll, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on. So first of all, let's go ahead and jump to the first slide. Where is it popping up? It's frozen. All right, we're just going to go without then. Um, so, as far as, as trade is concerned, I want to localize it, um, first of all, to a, a certain commodity, which in our case is pork. I also want to localize it um, from a standpoint of the state of Minnesota, and then also look at it from a, a bigger picture standpoint. So, we'll go ahead and get started then. So, just as a bigger picture standpoint, in 2017, Okay, about 20, just about 27% of all U.S. pork was exported. Okay, now to give you some perspective on that, is that in 1995, okay, which in my life isn't that long ago, but for probably many of your students it is, but in 1995 was the first year that the U.S. was self-sufficient for pork. Okay, which means that prior to 1995, we were importing pork from other countries to satisfy our own domestic needs. Okay? Now, we're closing in on exporting nearly 30% of everything we produce. Okay? And there's a lot of reasons for that, but it comes down to really three simple things. And that is that we are price competitive in the world. We have a reputation for very good quality. And the third, which as time has worn on, that has really, I think, served us extremely well, is that the U.S. reputation for food safety is unparalleled by any other country. Okay? And so when we look at many of the markets, especially if we look at Asian markets, our product is preferred by consumers because they're confident in the food safety side of things. Okay? along with the cost and, and the quality piece. So to put that in real dollars from a standpoint of a farmer, okay, is that um, coming up here in the next couple of uh, uh, several weeks, pigs will sell for about $150 for a pig, okay? So exports make up about 53 or so dollars of that. So look at that for Minnesota's economy. Minnesota, we uh, marketed about 16 million pigs in 2017. Um, so those exports, as you kind of do the math, are worth about 870 million uh, to Minnesota farmers. Okay, and I think more importantly, it's not just Minnesota farmers; it's Minnesota rural communities, because in the end, that's where those dollars come back to. Okay, and so whether it ends up employing somebody that is working on that farm, that's putting their kids in that local school, or you know all of the things that come with that. I think we need to always look at is that these trade things, these economic pieces, are not only good for the individual firm, okay, they're good for the communities that those firms operate in. Um, then one last thing, uh, a lot of people don't think about this because, at least in this country, pork is not the most widely eaten meat, but in the world it is, okay? And so, um, and we don't see that changing, at least uh, for a long ways down the road. Let's go to the next slide. So this gives you just an idea of where our product actually goes. And uh, what this chart does, and it's a little bit busy, but not too bad, is on the left-hand side, you can see the countries, and it's by volume of product. So in billion, or excuse me, in uh, millions of pounds, okay? And then on the right-hand side, it's got the actual value of that product. Okay, so in, in U.S. dollars. And so our number one volume market is Mexico. In fact, we're getting to the point where some months now, Mexico takes 40% of all the ham that is produced in the United States. Okay. Um, and it wasn't that long ago where they took almost nothing. So it's really ramped up, I mean, over time. Our number two market is China slash Hong Kong. Again, from a volume standpoint, we can get into the Q&A part later to talk about the impact of um, some of the things going on with China. Then Japan, Canada, South Korea, and then South America. And then you can see the, the Y over Y is year over year. Okay, so that's the percentage increase or decrease in 2017 compared to the previous year, 2016. So you can see that 
China was a market that was actually shrinking a little bit, especially from a volume standpoint. All the others were, were growing, and in some cases, pretty substantially growing. So let's go to the next slide. So where does this stuff actually go? So it's one of the things that isn't understood necessarily is that we don't export pigs, okay? It's the parts of the pig that get exported. And those parts of the pig will go to different places depending on what the cultural wants and needs and the financial ability of respective markets. And so, for example, I said earlier that there are some months we have about almost 40% of the ham we produce in this country will go to Mexico. Um, if we look at the loin, okay, that typically will go to the loin and tenderloin will typically go to Japan. Um, we export very little ribs and bellies. Bacon is where it comes from the belly. Okay? Uh, the U.S. is a rib and belly eating country. Okay? We're a ri and, but you don't necessarily see that in many other countries. Okay? Shoulders, South Korea is our largest market for shoulders. Again, it's cultural preference and so on. But now the next slide talks a lot about, in one kind of messy way, talks about what we actually, most of what we actually send to China. Okay? And it, by and large, it's pieces of the pig that we don't eat here. Okay? So heads, organ meat, feet, tails, um, ears, all of those things that, again, culturally are actually preferred in China. Okay? Which works out great for us, because otherwise if we, don't, if we didn't ship them to China, domestically here, they'd have a much less value. It'd either end up in pet food, or it would end up in fertilizer. Okay? The Chinese will pay more for ears and tails and feet than they will for a pork loin where a pork chop will come from. Okay? And in many cases, they'll pay up to twice as much for those pieces. So it's its highest and best value to go there. So with that, I think I'm kind of hitting my time. All I wanted to do is just give you a taste for some of the things that go on from a standpoint of, um, of exports. I'll just go to the next slide. When we get to the Q&A, because it can get really complicated and really deep on a lot of these subjects, be happy to talk about, all right, what's really going on with China. Um, also, North American Free Trade Agreement, which is really important to us. Because remember back to that slide, who were two of our top markets for exports? Mexico and Canada, okay? To mess those up, okay, would make China look easy, okay? Um, also, just worldwide competition, because just because the U.S. may want to step away from kind of the world stage in trade, doesn't mean that the rest of the world sits still, okay? So Mexico right now is actively negotiating with the European Union. Japan is doing the same thing. So just because we maybe take a time out doesn't mean the rest of the world does. Uh, Trans-Pacific Partnership was something that the U.S. has stepped away from. Then, let's see, a week and a half ago, the president was interested in getting back again. And then last Tuesday, maybe not so much. And so we'll see where that ends up going. Um, that could have been a big deal. May still be in, in the end. And then kind of the impacts of all of those things. So I'm going to save that for the Q&A side if there are any. Um, because again, that can get complicated real quick. And I would much prefer to talk about what you want to know about. So with that, I'll, I think I'll turn it over to the next speaker. Thank you, Dave. Um, as we were gathering and getting acquainted this morning before the panel, um, Dave, I'm going to ask you to help me out here. You says if you took a line and you drew 150 mile radius from around Fairmont, we produce what percentage of pork in the United States? About, About half. And I said, so what is the second largest pork producing area? And he said North Carolina, which didn't surprise me. I, I lived for 12 years in southeastern Virginia, about a half hour from the North Carolina border. And we got to talking about as the government was subsidizing tobacco farmers to get out of tobacco farming, they picked up on the pork, but some very different dynamics and what makes it profitable to do there. Um, but again, from Fairmont, you draw that radius 150 miles, uh, over half the pork. 
And so next is my uh, real honor to introduce Dr. Paul Mackey, who is one of our own professor of social work. Uh, and Paul is going to be speaking about the rural mental health and the farm bill. Um, connecting two of his worlds, Paul has served as president of the National Rural Mental Health Association, tackling rural mental health from the U.S. perspective, and has had occasion to have lunch with former First Lady Rosalind Carter. Most recently, Paul was asked by Senator Tina Smith to join his, her newly formed ag work group that is going to be preparing for debate on the next uh, farm bill, which will be critically important to us. Um, Paul is also on sabbatical this semester and has joined us this morning to share his expertise with us. So, Paul? Well, thank you for inviting me uh, and the uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I was asked that because this is hot topics. I was asked to talk about uh, a couple of the things that I that I've cared about a lot, and frankly, a lot of people do care about, but don't always necessarily connect together. And that is behavioral health services in rural areas, and then how that connects to federal policies or federal processing. So. This is a lot of information. I don't expect you to read it through fast. I don't expect myself to uh, read it through for you. Uh, but I want you to just maybe pick up on a few of the high points here, and then this will be made available, I understand. If not, contact me. I'm more than happy to share it. But uh, one of the biggest challenges that we've been finding historically in rural America is the lack of behavioral health practitioners. We are doing a wonderful job in the United States preparing psychologists, uh, uh, family uh, uh, consumer uh, 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 counselors, social workers. We do a good job of that. What we don't necessarily do a particularly good job of is getting them out into rural areas, which is where uh, the services are very much needed. And this is been identified as a long-term problem dating back. Actually, somebody was asking me earlier, how far back does this really go? And I found evidence to go back to 1924. So this is not a new problem, but we do need to respond to this and other issues around it in new ways. I wanted to just put a map up here to give you a sense. Out here in, in places like southern Minnesota, it's very easy to know rural isn't it? I, I, any direction, two miles, you drive to Eagle Lake, you've already passed fields. You, it doesn't take much. Well, when you take a look at the United States, uh, if you, you look, the, the, the shaded areas are the metros, but the non-shaded are the, the non-metros. Uh, and this is based on census data. So as you can see, as far as a landmass goes, what we're really talking about is the rural population of the United States represents only about 15% of the total. So about 85% are living in the shaded areas, uh, and yet uh, it's about 80% of the land mass. So we're actually talking about an, yet another overarching problem when you look at size. So uh, the reason why I said 15% is because that's the number I like, but then if you talk to other people, they'll say it's upwards of 20%. There's all kinds of uh, nuances in there. But what we look at, and, and I was looking at this largely as this hot topics kind of educational, what are we gonna do, what can we do? We know that there's limited higher education opportunities. There's this serious lack of providers. Uh, viability, this comes up in the research, mine and others around this notion that rural is sometimes seen as less desirable to live in. It depends on who you ask. It's actually seen as more desirable to live in depending on who you ask. Uh, professional burnout, that always comes up, so I always put it in the slides. Done it for 15 years. Yes, it happens, but it's not as big a deal when you look at the numbers as you think. And then to get to kind of the, the crux of this conversation, state and federal responses, that's the big issue. How can we really respond to this? So <clears throat> what we know about this workforce, because I have contended and debated the argument that if we don't have a viable, effective workforce in rural America, be it behavioral health or any other industry, then none of the rest of the conversations matter. If somebody's not delivering the services, it doesn't matter what kind of services you have. Make sense? So I've 
been hanging my hat on workforce for a very long time. Uh, what do we know? Well, we know that if you grow up in a rural environment, if you complete clinical uh, or practicum uh, internships, if you go to rural-based facilities, if you receive education and training in rural culture concepts, you're more likely to go out and practice in rural. Uh, rural practitioners are telling us through the research that what they need is improvements in broadband technology, preparation for rural practice, expanded rural practicum opportunities, uh, stronger connection with rural. This is all starting to fit together, but we've yet to really answer the how do we do that kind of question yet. We've just kind of dissected the data. Recommendations at this point to really respond to rural behavioral health. We put the workforce question first. We create pipelines where we're more or less selectively recruiting for rural because we know that if you're from a rural area, you're more likely to go back to a rural area. We develop rural peer support networks. We talk about online education, which immediately then pulls in the broadband conversation. And where I'm going now is this notion of leveraging resources in and around the Farm Bill. We're rewriting the Farm Bill. We do this every five years. We're rewriting it this year. You know this. <clears throat> what a lot of people don't necessarily know is that there are the several, the 12 different titles within the Farm Bill. Title four is Nutrition and SNAP Program, which is a very big part of it and a huge uh, social service component. Six is rural development, including economic development. Seven is extension, which is already human and family and human support services developed in and existing in rural. And then 12 is that last catch group, the miscellaneous. Nobody ever quite knows what, I guess it's where you put stuff. Well, actually, outreach program for socially disadvantaged, uh, opportunities for growth and development. The farm bill, I argue, is actually a wonderful place for us to start having this rural behavioral health conversation that we know that we're having anyway. We know that right now the re most recent data that we have is suggesting that we're seeing suicides at a rate of 90, per, or, 90 or higher out of 100,000 farmers and agricultural workers in the United States. It's a, it's a real number. It's probably higher now. It's creeping up again. We see the economic disadvantage. We see the opportunities for growth and development. We don't seem to really know how to move that forward yet. My suggestion is that we go with the Farm Bill. I don't want to take up more time. I have lots of information. I look forward to your questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. I think your presentation underscores, as we look at ag food and natural resources at university, certainly there's a, a strong leg in the ag business, and there's a strong leg in the ag science. But when you look at ag public policy and many of the other areas that ag um, touches upon, really we have students and faculty across the university that are doing very important things related to ag. Which provides me with a good opportunity before I introduce our next speaker. We have coming up yet, not a part of our colloquium series, but a part of our events for this year on May the 1st, an event coming up in CSU 253 from 6 to 7.30. Jean, would you like to share a little bit about that and what that's going to be about? Hello, um, had a professor in uh, social and behavior science um, working in class, and they did a uh, survey, and I heard out about food insecurity on campus. So if you can join us for that event, I think that's uh, we'll well worth our time. And then what do we do about that situation? Because it extends again abroad across our campus as well as in our community. Uh, once again, that's uh, May 1st at 6 o'clock in room 253 upstairs. And it's kind of an, um, an, an oxymoron. Here we are in the country, the, a part of the country that produces over half of the world's pork, but yet we have people who are going hungry. 
So, um, sticking along the rural theme, our next uh, panelist is one of our newer professors, Jennifer Longren, who's the assistant professor and coordinator of our alcohol and drug studies program in the College of Allied Health and Nursing here at Minnesota State Mankato. Uh, Jennifer is also an alum of our doctoral program in counseling student personnel. I came to know of Jennifer's expertise last fall when she brought Senator Baker in and talked about the opioid crisis and particularly in rural communities. So Jennifer will be sharing with us um, eight to 10 minutes of expertise um, in upon the impact of the opioid epidemic in rural communities. Jennifer? All right, thank you so much for coming and thanks for inviting me. It's, it's an honor to be a part of this panel and it, I like the idea of hot topics just on a college campus, it's so fun to hear what's happening and to just have this awesome discourse with all these wonderful people. So I'm Dr. Jennifer Lundgren, as she said. I'm, it's my second year here. I'm the program coordinator for the Alcohol and Drug Studies program. Um, and I'm really, really proud of, our, of the program that we've, we have. I train future addiction counselors to go out into the workforce. Um, so today I'm gonna talk about the opioid crisis. And this is a huge topic and we only have about eight minutes. So I'm gonna keep it as simple as possible. And again, if you have any other questions, please feel free to ask. All right, so this is kind of what we're going to cover again. The first thing that I wanted to talk about is just what is an opioid. So historically an opioid has kind of been differentiated to only synthetic types of drugs derived from opium and now it's just an umbrella term that describes all drugs derived from opium. So this is morphine, this is codeine, this is heroin, this is fentanyl and carfentanil. And carfentanil is the drug that's, it's an elephant tranquilizer and that's what you hear about in the media that if any first responders come into any sort of contact with it, they're overdosing because it is so powerful. It's about 10,000 times more powerful than morphine. So I think what's really critically important to understand about all of this umbrella of opioids is that these drugs numb pain. These are the best drugs on the market if you want to numb pain. And this is a really philosophical idea. If you think about you know, mental health, if you think about addiction in, in rural communities specifically, you know, the US has 5% of the world's population, but we consume 80% of the world's opioids, the global supply of opioids. So this really is a question of why are we craving and so thirsty to numb our pain? And it's just a really interesting idea that I think is important to understand. So the stats now, they say 140 people die every single day of an overdose death, and about 78 people die from an opioid-related overdose death every single day. You know, I think in some ways we kind of become desensitized to stats like this, but if you really think about 78 people every single day in America, that's 78 families who have to plan funerals, that's 78 families who are grieving the losses of their loved ones. And if you think about how one life just touches so many others, it's, it's a devastating stat, and it's 100% preventable. All right, so this is, a, again, this is a complicated kind of how did we get here question. But I want to touch on it because I think it's important. So one of the biggest things as to kind of how we got to this epidemic level of this opioid crisis is the changing perspective of pain. So in the late 80s and the early 90s, the medical community said, we need to treat pain as a serious condition in and of itself. So what they started doing, every single patient that came in was assessed for pain. And what they did is they called it the fifth vital. If you think about other vitals that are taken of blood pressure and heart rate, you get a really kind of quantitative number to tell you what that, that measure is. But if you think about assessing pain, you know, it's a subjective self-report that's essentially on a continuum of a smiley face to a really grimacing face. So all of a sudden, every single patient is being assessed for their pain levels subjectively. Another huge thing that happened around the same time is that Purdue Pharma came out with Oxycontin. And Oxycontin, they said, this is non-addictive. It's a 12-hour extended release formula. Now in 1980, there was a study done by Porter and Jix. They, they assessed 11,000 patients that were all getting treated for acute conditions and giving medical doses of opioids. And they said, you know what? Less than 1% of patients are becoming addicted to opioids. Less than 1%. So Purdue Pharma latched onto that stat. Everyone's getting assessed for pain. And this culminated in 2012 that there were 259 
million prescriptions written for Oxycontin in one year. And again, if you abuse a prescription, it, you develop an addiction. So what we're finding is that people were getting prescribed huge amounts of opioids for ev from everything from an ingrown toenail to teeth getting pulled. There's all of these prescriptions floating around. And then when doctors would stop the prescription, they try to buy Oxy on the street. It can go for as much as $10 a pill. And the same exact high can be found with heroin. And that's why we have this huge cohort of people who are switching from prescription drugs to street heroin, which is laced with other carfentanil type drugs, and they're overdosing. All right, so when we think about the opioid crisis in rural America, and this is a big trend right now, is that overdose deaths in rural communities are rising. Um, there is a big study done by the American Farm Bureau Foundation and the National Farmers Union, and they found that 74% of farmers or farm workers were directly impacted by the opioid crisis in some way. So 27% reported that someone that they knew and loved were either misused or were addicted to opioids, and 16% reported that they themselves had misused or were addicted to opioids. So about three in four farmers reported that it's really easy to get large amounts of opioids without a prescription, but only one in three said that it, treatment is really easy to find. So why might this be happening? Again, these are the drugs that numb pain. So if you think about rural communities, if there's isolation, if there's not a lot of treatment, like we heard Paul talk about, if there's poor access to health care, People are developing addictions at very alarming rates. And the other thing that's really important to understand is that there's a lot of stigma, there's a lot of shame. Farmers don't necessarily talk about how they're feeling. Um, they might just kind of keep their feelings inside. And if they do develop an addiction, there's nowhere to get treated. Even an AA meeting, if you Google AA meetings in Mankato, you can go to about 11 different meetings around the city in one day. Whereas if you live in a rural community, you might have to, it, it might be once a week and you might have to drive 25 miles to get there. So it's just this kind of complicated, um, all these different kind of things happening at once. The other thing too that I found really interesting about this survey is that they said that a lot of farmers and farm workers reported that increasing the stigma would help in addressing this issue. All right, so we know that this has been an issue. The other thing is that they said about 30% of farmers reported even knowing that this was a problem at all. And I think what that tells me is that a lot of people are sort of suffering on their own, not knowing that other people are struggling with the same thing. All right, so again, the American Farm Bureau Foundation and the National Farmers Union, what they did is that they partnered and they came up with this movement called Farm Town Strong. And I think that this is so awesome. I think that this just shows the pride of a community coming together, people you know, connecting and working towards a common goal. So what they do, this is dedicated to people in rural communities. They have resources for treatment. They have prevention materials. They have a hotline that people can call to get access to things. They also have prescription disposals, which again is critically important because a lot of people get their prescription opioids from relatives, from their friends' moms, who had their, who, where their prescriptions are readily available. So again, they have this, they have this really cool social media campaign that's called Farm Town Strong. Um, it's worth checking out if you want to give that a shot. So again, this is a huge topic. Right now, Amy Klobuchar is pushing for a billion dollars of federal funding to be spent on all of these different areas. And this is from the governor's action plan. These are kind of the topics that we're really trying to focus our efforts. Prevention, just so people understand that these drugs are addicting, how to use their prescriptions as prescribed, um, and just the emergency response. I know you might have heard of the drug Narcan or Naloxone. This is a drug that's administered that reverses an overdose. And again, this is another trend in rural communities. If someone's overdosing, if you have to drive 25, 35, 75 miles to get to where they are, people die in that time. So they're making Naloxone readily available. You can pick it up at CVS now without a prescription and any person can, can administer it. Um, and then just in law enforcement efforts. Um, so just kind of having all of these different disciplines coming together to fight this epidemic. All right, so what MSU is doing about this, and I'm very proud of this, is that we had our first annual opioid symposium in the fall. Our second one is coming up. We're partnering with the Department of Social Work, and that's gonna be on September 26th of this year. 
But what we did is we had Narcan trainings where participants could take home Narcan kits free of charge. We had a candlelight vigil by the fountain where we honored just those who have overdosed, those who have died, those who suffer from addiction. We also had Dave Baker, State Representative Dave Baker, come to our campus and was our keynote. He talked about his, his journey with his son who died of a heroin overdose after being prescribed pain medicine after a football injury from St. Thomas. So again, and we're expanding it to a treatment resource fair just to kind of get knowledge about treatment centers into, into the hands of community members. So again, this is a community coming together to hopefully kind of numb, to hopefully mitigate some of that pain that people are feeling. And thank you so much again for this opportunity. Thank you, Jennifer, for bringing your expertise uh, to our campus and sharing it widely with the community. I know I participated in some of the events in the first opioid symposium and learned uh, quite a bit. I remember there was a, a woman who was sitting here in the first row and her son had died of heroin and after he had passed, um, law enforcement showed up and were talking about how they had been tracking him on the dark web and she was saying, if you knew he was so addicted, then why didn't you do something about prevention? And it opened up a discussion about the um, necessary, sometimes separation between law enforcement and public health. Um, and we don't want people not going to public health for treatment because they're afraid they're gonna be arrested, but then the reverse can be challenging as well. So mark September 26th uh, for next year. Now we're going to move along and talk to uh, hear from two uh, farmers. Our first is going to be from Lauren Molinar from Molinar Farms, who is going to focus. Uh, he could talk about many things, but this morning he's going to focus on sustainable, responsible farming. So, Lauren. Thank you very much for the introduction and I want to thank everybody for taking time to be here uh, today. So um, yeah, I'm going to focus a little bit on sustainable and responsible practices that we do on our farm. Now you might be looking at this picture that I chose here and yes, that is our farmstead, but it is just a little bit dated. This was probably taken 60 years ago would be my guess and that's kind of, kind of a driving point with the sustainability is making sure that you can pass this on from generation to generation. Um, um, Molinar Farms is my wife Holly and I, my mom and dad Gordy and Shelley, and Jesse and Karina Paps. Jesse and I are college friends who um, he kind of fell in love with the area up in our area and he started working with our family. So there's three families working together on our farm. And it's very important to us on our farm we keep looking back at our mission statement and our mission statement is striving to make land stewardship, animal care, and efficient production a family tradition. So again, looking back a little bit, this is my, these are my great, great, great grandparents, Klaus and Grichy, who came over from Holland back in the late 1800s. And once you know it, they settled in Holland Township in Candy, Ohio County uh, with many other Dutch settlers. And then fast forward a little bit, this is my wife Holly and I, and we are the sixth generation of Molinars to be farming in our community. So what makes up our farm? We raise corn, soybeans, and alfalfa on our land. We raise nursery pigs, and I'll touch on that here in just a little bit, what that all entails. And we also work with a custom forage harvesting uh, group that uh, chops corn into corn silage and alfalfa into haylage for feed for dairies around our community. This is a picture of our workforce. It's myself, my dad Gordy in the middle, and Jesse Pabst, who is actually from uh, Sanborn, just about, uh, about an hour west of here. Things have changed over the last uh, 60 years or so. The one picture shows a tillage tractor that my grandpa bought new back in the mid 50s um, compared to what we're planning to use again this spring as our tillage tractor. So things have changed over those years. Some of the technology that we use on our farm to try and boost the sustainability. One of the first things we use is auto guidance steering in our tractors, which ultimately helps us to save fuel uh, we have a repeatable tracking. We can use the same passes year after year or you know, day after day. And it helps to reduce operator fatigue. Now, 
we're still in the tractors, don't worry. We're, we're in there monitoring everything and making sure everything's working right, but it has really helped us to be more efficient. The bottom picture that you see is actually a picture of our planter that we plant corn and soybeans with. And uh, well, because of the auto steer, I was able to turn around in the tractor seat and take a picture of the planter. But uh, uh, this help, we, we utilize variable rate seeding as well, which helps us to save seed reduces overlap and it improves plant health. We're able to look at our farm acre by acre and we can see the more productive areas and maybe some of the areas that aren't quite as productive. And if we come into a very productive area, we may plant more seeds there, trying to utilize everything that's there. And if we come into a spot that's maybe not quite as productive, we may cut the seeds back, making sure that they don't have to compete with other seeds to make sure that we have better plant health. Every fall on our land, we grid soil sand. I'm not going to get too far into the weeds on this, but uh, I think it's very important. Let's say you have a 160 acre field. Um, an acre is roughly about a, like a football field. So a 160 acre field be like, you know, 160 football fields. We grid sample, we test every two and a half acres separate from each other. So we'll have many, many, many soil samples taken out of a 160 acre field. And we treat each one of those grids individually. So if we all of a sudden go into one spot and we're like, we have, we have enough plant food here for the next year, plant food does not get applied there. We're only placing it where we need it, when we need it, and to a specific amount based on production levels. Then at the end of the year, when we're out bringing in the crop and harvesting, we have a yield mapping system in our combine. Our combine knows right where it's at out in the field, and it's monitoring what, what the yield is coming in. And this helps us with our crop analysis for the year. We can maybe make some comparisons. Uh, there's many different kinds of corn that we plant, and we can maybe pick and choose which ones fit our farm better and which ones we maybe don't need. And it just helps us to build that database so we know what has worked and what will work again in the future, or we hope will work again in the future. Well, now I want to talk about our pigs just a little bit. So like I said, we're, uh, we, we have nursery barns at our farm, meaning we bring the pigs in. They're about two weeks old, so that little guy I'm holding there, the red and white guy, he's, uh, he's about two weeks old. They're about 12 pounds at the time. And we will raise them in our barns for, we'll have them for six to seven weeks. And when they go out, they're about 50 pounds. And at that point, they move into a different style barn where they'll consider it a grower barn where they'll be raised up to market size. Um, our barns are all indoor housing, they're climate controlled, meaning it doesn't matter if it's the 6th of January or the 6th of July, it's gonna be 78 degrees in there where the pigs are comfortable. And uh, it helps us to be able to walk and monitor the herd health in there at all times. And another important thing with these barns is to know that Antibiotics are only ever given to our pigs if they are needed and always under the direction of a veterinarian. It's not something that we want to do. It's done very rarely, but it's also something that we need to be able to do to make sure that we have consistent herd health and the pigs are all feeling good. Also with these barns, we're able to utilize the manure from the pigs as a plant food source for our farms to have a natural fertilizer to put back out on our fields. Well, now on to the forage harvesting. So this gives us an opportunity to work with many different friends and neighbors in our community, and we can bounce ideas off of each other. Um, for about three months in the summer, usually months of June, July, and August, we work with the haylage chopping crew, um, which essentially we cut the alfalfa, gets chopped and piled at these dairies for plant, or for food for their cows. And alfalfa is a crop that once we plant it, we leave it there for four years and it keeps coming back each year. It's, you know, we, uh, we keep it there for four years and then rotate it back into our corn and soybean rotation. And then in the fall, we have two weeks where we go 24 hours a day, six days a week, chopping corn into corn silage for feed for these dairy cows as well. And once this has all been completed, then there again, we can work with these dairies, get manure back from the dairies to apply it to our fields for plant food for the coming year. So how does this all relate to sustainability? Well, if you look in the dictionary, sustainability, I found 
two definitions and after reading the first one i wasn't really satisfied but it was capable of being sustained i thought that left uh, a lot to interpretation uh, the second was a method of using a resource so that the resource is not depleted or permanently damaged and i think these steps that we're taking on our farm through the use of technology and different avenues for using for plant food only applying where we need is what is helping us to be sustainable on our farm but capable of being sustained and i want to have these two pictures side by side and that is the foresight of generations gone by knowing that they need to make a living they need to care for the land their animals as best they can to make sure that there's a sixth generation that can take over the family farm with that i'd like to thank you and i look forward to uh, any questions you may have thank you thank you the little pigs are very cute Okay, uh, now it is our uh, time for our fifth uh, panelist for today, and as I think about it, our last one for the entire year. Um, there, as I received uh, Karen Casper's uh, bio from Casper Dairy, I could have picked out many, many things to showcase. Um, and I learned a little bit more about uh, Karen this morning beforehand. But um, Karen, uh, amongst her accomplishments are she was a finalist for Country Woman of the Year and also has a children's book series called the Cowboss Series. And I also learned this morning that she worked in claims and insurance until about 2003 and then became a part of the family dairy farm. So I'm sure Karen has much to share with us today, but she's going to talk to us about her family's dairy farm. So. Hello. Thank you for the opportunity to let me come and talk about our family and our farm, two things that are very, very near and dear to me. Um, I grew up in um, a city, small town, and so I didn't have much exposure to farming or agriculture. And my husband grew up on a dairy farm with a very large family. Here's 18 children in his family. So this was all very new to me. So um, I continued to work um, as we did talked about what we wanted to do for um, occupations and I wanted to continue with my insurance occupation and that was managing a, an insurance claims processing department. And of course I thought I would do that until I retired. So I told my husband, if you want a dairy farm, you can do your thing and I'll do mine and we'll, we'll get along fine. So in about 2003, I decided that I needed to make a change and that it was important for me to be at home helping with the farming and the day-to-day -day decisions that took place on our farm as we continued to grow. We have um, three children um, and in fact our um, farm logo, um, our, our mission is to produce quality milk. And in order to get quality milk, of course, you have to take quality care of your animals and your land and all your resources. You can go to my, oh, I can. Um, here are some pictures of my family. Um, we have three children, and my husband and son and I are the people who run the, the dairy farm on a daily basis. And our two daughters are also involved in agriculture in a, in a different sense. Um, our middle daughter, our middle, middle child, she is the marketing director for a farm tillage equipment company. And then our youngest daughter is um, a district marketing uh, manager for a seed company, DeKalb Asgro, and she has a territory in northern Iowa. So they've all decided that being in agriculture was something that was very, very important to them, and it, and it makes us feel as parents very proud to have them also working in the egg industry. We currently milk about 350 to 400 cows, and 30 years ago when we started our, our dairy farm, we milked 65 cows. So over the years, that's changed quite a bit for us, and the reason for that change is when our son graduated from high school and decided he wanted to study dairy science, he was going to be coming back home to work on the farm with us. So we knew we needed to be able to provide for two families off of one farm. So because of his training and, and, and schooling and expertise, we've continued to grow our dairy herd 
uh, because of the, the good genetics and, and some of the other ideas that he's helped us implement on our farm. Now we grow on our farm corn and hay, which of course is used for feed for our, our dairy herd. So, um, it, it, you know, we work um, all summer long. It's, it'll start here pretty soon. We'll be planting our corn and then we go right into making hay. And so making hay is an all summer project. Then in the fall, of course, we do our harvest like every other farm. And um, in addition to that, we'll, then we also make corn stalks. After the, the corn is, is harvested or chopped, we make um, corn stalk bales, which provides bedding for our animals for the rest of the year. Um, as um, Marilyn mentioned, I um, decided, and I had a passion for writing children's books for many years. We, we always provide uh, school tours or farm tours on our farm, and our farm has grown so that it's very, very busy, and it's, it's harder for schools to get busing to come to the farm to do the tours. So I knew I needed to reach these kids um, in a different sense, and that was writing my children's books. And so with the encouragement of both my daughters, they said, Mom, I think it's about time you start what you've been wanting to do for the last 20 years. So I started writing my children's books which are based upon real farm stories and, and our farm in general. So as you see there's a picture of our um, Jack Russell dog in the corner there and he is kind of my inspiration to all of my stories because he's there every day by my side helping me do my farm chores and um, it, it, he's very smart, he helps us with herding animals and keep them in pens and if something gets out he helps us get them back in where they belong. So um, he's an important piece to our family too. Over the years, um, we, we, we believe really strongly in community service, and that's what we encourage the kids to do, too. So um, the kids are now uh, enjoying giving back to the communities that help them grow into um, where they are today, and so that's 4-H and FFA. So we all continue to be involved in those types of things. So um, our family was recognized last year as Farm Family of the Year, and so that was very, very... Um, um, special award for us and in 2016 my daughter had nominated me through a national program for farm mom of the year and so lo and behold I got this phone call in uh, m the middle of the winter and she was telling me how I had won Midwest uh, farm mom of the year so that that took us on some special um, trips also and, and opportunities to then talk about what, what we do on dairy farms. Here's a uh, couple of pictures. Uh, when we um, go out, the top one is when we are baling our hay. Um, that's changed a lot too. I always told my husband when we baled these little small square bales that weighed 40 to 50 pounds and had to throw them around, I said, this is crazy. You make them, you throw them on the wagon, you take them home, you put them up in the top of the barn, you throw them back out and then get them, you know, take the strings off to feed them to an animal. I said, this is just too much work. So of course now, because we're the scale we are, we, we bale everything in the large round bales, which of course you can handle with skid loaders or, or a different loader to, to haul them home and, and feed them. So it's much much uh, easier process, although it takes a lot of months to get all the feed made that we need. And then the picture down below is where the um, corn chopper comes in and chops the silage, and we that gets um, taken to the farm with semi-trucks, and it gets put into a pile and packed with uh, large loaders so that it, it preserve, helps preserve it for the months to come that provide the feed for the cows for the rest of the year. So it's a pretty impressive, every year I watch that corn chopper, and it's amazing. He can do um, eight rows at a time, and he um, can take a field of um, 210 acres and have it done within two days. So it's, it's quite a process. And here, of course, are the four books that I've written so far um, in my book series, and I have about 10 or 15 more that I have titles to and the stories. I just have to get them um, put on paper and, and get them submitted to the publisher. Now, in all of the things that we do on our farm, we also feel that it's very important to be involved in the cooperatives that work with us and the business partners that we have. And so our cooperative, um, we sell our milk to and through Rochester, Minnesota. So at that plant, most of the milk goes for cheese, and some of the milk then goes over to the Kemp's processing plant for bottled milk. So 
so my husband and I, my husband's a director for AMPI and I'm on a um, county board as secretary. Um, Minnesota DHI is also a one of the partners that we work with and they we have them come in once a month and we test our milk. And we test the milk per cow so that we can get a feel for what, what's the quality of the milk that that, provide, that cow is providing for us. And so we can tell many things from that is um, are they producing up to um, par? Um, are there some health issues possibly? And we also do something that we've been doing for a couple of years is pregnancy testing through the milk. And so that has saved a lot of labor for us on our farm as well as the veterinarian. So that's that's something huge that technology keeps changing and giving us new um, tools to use to make our work more effective. Um, also, I'm on the board of directors for the Midwest Dairy Association, and we, um, like other um, farm commodities, we pay a checkoff money into the um, association so that they can do research for us and, and product development and so forth. Then also my husband is on the board for our Steel County American Dairy Association, and that's where we do a lot of activities and, and um, opportunities for people to come in and see animals, to visit a farm. We do a breakfast on the farm every year, and um, it's our chance to let people see and touch agriculture when they normally do not get an opportunity to do that. So we hosted the breakfast on our farm last year, and we had a little over a thousand people come for breakfast and the petting zoo and have breakfast and just interact and see what we do on a, on a daily basis. Um, also, um, I've called, talked about the Country Woman of the Year. That, that was back in 2003. That was through Country Woman magazine. Someone had submitted my name as um, a country woman. And so um, they um, honored me as one of the top three finalists. And um, I guess that covers everything else there. So that's kind of an overview of my family and us and, and what we're doing. And um, like I said, we believe in community service and education. And so we're out there um, doing what we can to, to help people understand farming. Um, you know, people are more than th three generations removed from farming. And so even in our area of Oatana, um, it, you think it's considered more rural, but there are kids who've never seen or heard anything about the, the farms. And if you ask them where their food comes from, the answer is high V. So it's very concerning because these people need to know where their food comes from. And that's, of course, what we continue to try to do. Now, the other thing that's important to me, too, is um, mentoring youth. I, I mentored my kids as they were growing up, and um, I've continued to do that with some of the high school kids that I get to work on our farm. And um, it gives me great pride in seeing how they've grown. And, you know, you take these children who've lived in the city, and, and they come to the country to work, and um, it's truly amazing. So these kids are now, I have three of them that have gone through um, working with me during for the, through the school work program, and they're... they're um, going to school to study ag in some respect. And so it's very rewarding to help them grow. And you know, you ask these kids, they don't know each other really, um, what you know, what inspired them to do this? And it was word of mouth that they heard, you know, someone else who'd worked for us and that it was, they thought, they thought it'd be great to work outside and, and um, be, you know, instead of in an office or a factory setting or whatever. And um, it's nice to hear these kids all will go back and say that they considered that I, I was one of their strong mentors. So I feel like I've had a great impact, not on just my own kids, but some of these other kids. And so I'm continually working with the teachers at school the ag teachers specifically to help me recruit uh, other new young kids that are interested in agriculture. So thank you for taking an interest in being here today. Thank you, Karen, for sharing your story. I think you exemplify one of the themes that we've seen throughout the year and is that all of our panelists um, are involved in ag in, in many ways. They might have one main way, but they're very, very versatile with many, many kind of talents, as well as their engagement in community service. And if you were here for our panel last week, you recognize the photo. One of Karen's daughters was one of our panelists last week. And as she was talking about her journey from a young girl growing up on a farm and how she wanted to do anything but, but then how she came full circle, it often comes down to uh, a mentor, a faculty member, 
someone in their university education that helped them to see that connection back to ag, maybe in a different way than was their parents' journey, but in forging the way for the future generations. So we're at the time now where we have about 30 minutes for questions and answers, and we will have the panelists, we'll share the microphone. We do ask that, um, as you ask your questions, that you wait for the microphone because of the live streaming and the recording, it is important to be able to utilize uh, the microphone, so. Who has the first question or comment for one of our panelists? Tom? And if you would please introduce yourself so others in the room and so forth can get to know who you are. Um, Tom Norman, Dean University Extended Education. It's a question for Paul on the Farm Bill and the SNAP program in particular as we see some students that suffer with significant levels of food insecurity. I wondered if you could give us some idea of evolutions we could potentially look forward to in the new Farm Bill to help make that easier or connect those students more fully to programs that contribute to self-sufficiency. Thank you. Well, those are great questions, Tom. Um, I think it's important to always keep in mind that the SNAP program, of course, is a federal uh, food program, nutrition program, that is uh, essentially means tested, meaning you, you have to qualify to get it. Um, <clears throat> But the conversation doesn't really have to stop there, uh, though it typically has in the past, because we'll usually just say, well, it's a program. If you qualify, you can get the services. Uh, I do know that being on Senator Smith's uh, work group, uh, one of the, if not possibly the most uh, spoken question was, why can't we have more flexibility? And I'm hearing that, whether it be with that work group, I'm hearing it in uh, Washington, D.C. when I'm there, uh, hearing it through the, uh, uh, the federal uh, agencies, other federal agencies that either touch or otherwise are participating in these kinds of things. Um, and I think that that might be where the answer lies. Is it's not really, it, it is SNAP, but it's not really SNAP. SNAP is a federal food program. It's flexibility and our ability to have more opportunity to include more people as well as build out. The fact is there's a lot of people who qualify. Uh, when you talk about our students or this upcoming event, um, they simply don't know that they qualify. And if they do know they qualify, they don't know how to access. So there's an education component as well. That answers. Thank you. Another question for one of our panelists. Hi, I'm Matt Caproth, a plant biologist, a professor here. Um, we've been working a little bit trying to build up our understanding of what we can provide for the ag industry in terms of uh, training students, but I'm curious, especially for our first and our last two speakers, that what skill sets are you looking for from students that are graduating that want to go into ag? Um, we're just curious of uh, what they're missing, I guess, right now. Dave, you want to start us off with that one? Um, sure, thanks for the question. And I think that, um, uh, first of all, as we look at just plain big picture demographics, and we're really excited to see um, Minnesota State be this, you know, non-land grant, and it's and part of it's just again demographics. So if we look at the number of students that are sitting in traditional land grant institutions right now, and we match that up to the jobs that are available within the agricultural field, it is not a match whatsoever. Okay, there is so much more demand out there compared to what the supply that's coming out from, from our traditional land grants. Um, you know, and I'd say the things that especially um, employers would be looking at from a place like here, okay, would be, I know every employer talks about soft skills, you know, and people skills and those types of things, and I don't care what job you're hiring for, that, that comes up over and over and over again. I mean, you can have fantastic technical skills, but if you can't deal with your, your client or the person you're trying to sell to or the person next to you in the office, that can be a pretty limiting factor. And then I think the other thing is just more real, like, is much like kind of hands-on sort of business. 
Um, as I talk with some of the employers that have looked here, they, you know, if you've got students that can get internships, um, that just enriches their experience so much more um, as they, you know, they prepare to really get out into the workforce. And so I think as much of like the hands-on business side of things, to where they can really be developing that business acumen. And so I'm saying that for farms that may be looking for people that would be working in like logistics, maybe working in accounting, um, of which we have a lot of farms now, and more and more that have got people that do that on a full-time basis. Um, HR, I mean, those were all going to be, I think, growth areas. I mean, I've had a couple of our members that said, you know, when I first started farming, I never dreamed that 25 or 30 years later, what I've really turned into is a logistics company. I mean, I'm trucking things in, I'm trucking things out. You know, if we look at the examples that Lauren had, I mean, that, that's what he kind of is. I mean, with moving forage around and all of those kinds of things. So logistics, I think, is, is going to be huge going down the, the road. And then, like I said, the HR piece, I think, is going to be something that's going to continue to grow and grow. So I won't answer your question, but I think that's where I would go. Karen? One of the things that I think is very important, and, and David talked about that, is the soft skills. But both of my daughters got a degree in ag um, communications and leadership. And so that's opened the door to many, many different jobs for both of them. Um, they had minors in, in um, sales and marketing also. So I think you have to also look at, um, you know, some of the skills that match the person too, you know, like this young gentleman that's just gonna graduate and is working for me currently, he's actually gonna go to an ag mechanics course and, and do something with fixing equipment and, and working with machines, that type of thing. So I, I still think that when you look at leadership and communications, that can open the door to a lot of things. Now, if you have someone who is really wanting to, to dig in the dirt, of course, that's an agronomy. And there are a lot of opportunities there for agronomists, too. So, um, and like I said, my, my daughter likes the marketing piece, so that's what she's doing. And the other one likes sales, so that's what she's involved with. But um, going back to, I think, those soft skills is really important because you can, if you have those skills, then you're going to have um, training programs vary from company to company. They can train you what they need to for your day-to-day -day type of duties, but they can't teach you or train you leadership and communications if you don't have that piece already. Thank you. Um, as we gathered this morning um, and just uh, visiting with our panelists beforehand, I was sharing with them our university's efforts under um, Brian Martin's leadership to develop an ag minor. And they found that very attractive that you can pair with different majors if the students have a basic command of the concepts and knowledge and vocabulary and so forth. And we're almost more excited about that than some of the other specialized degrees as well. Also, for those who are members of the university community, I wanted to share with you, I've started to develop a list with our panelists throughout the year in their contact information. Certainly you can see the names of the panelists on the website, but throughout the year many of our panelists indicated their organizations had internships available and some of them even following the panel have shared with me uh, internship announcements even for this summer. For example, we had Gracia Johnson from the um, Agricultural Worker Project who shared with me a, an internship announcement for this summer and I sent it out to several faculty. Um, so as you have internship opportunities now or in the future or know of others, please send them our way so we can disseminate them and work with our Career Services Center. And I think that's one of the um, nice takeaways from this event is we built a lot of new connections to create those win-win opportunities. Another question, those have been two great ones so far. Hi, I'm Lori Stevemer. Uh, my husband and I farm and I also work for uh, Hubbard Feeds. A question for Dr. Lundgren, and I don't remember exactly how the statistic went, but I believe it was over half of the farmers or people in the rural area had access to opioids without a prescription. So can you expound on that a little bit more? Are they getting it from sure. friends or where is that stream of opioids coming from? Yep, absolutely. So where they get it from is it just people get prescriptions written for them and then they just keep them. So what we've seen a lot of is that it's specifically for adolescents, it might be they're at a friend's house, they go into their, they're trying to get 
high or drunk or whatever, um, and they go into their friend's medicine cabinet and they just have access to this. It might be grandparents, um, it's just anyone whose house that they're in um, that has large supplies. Um, otherwise, people might sell their old prescriptions because it is really, really valuable. They can get a lot of money for doing that. Um, so that's kind of the, the biggest kind of trend that we're seeing is just getting them from other people, siblings, friends, parents. Do you have a follow-up question, Lori? Mm -hmm. um, more of a follow-up comment. Um, I was surprised. All three of my children had their wisdom teeth removed, and you know, walking out the door, we were handed a prescription for some type of opioid for each of those kids. Yeah. Whether we need it or not, they were just like, here, you might need it, so here it is. And I was thinking, wow, I could fill this, and I could sell it, which of course I know is illegal, but it yeah. made me realize really how ex easy those things are. Absolutely. Access. Absolutely. I, I think also in, in my experience and probably every one of us in the room, we're given that prescription and we've come to know how addictive it is and we might take one or two, but then we want to get on to uh, an over-the-counter remedy as fast as possible. But not only do they hand you a prescription, but oftentimes it's a 30-day prescription when you might need maybe three doses to get through the worst of that um, and so forth. And uh, again, physicians had a lot of pressure from that fifth vital sign to prescribe. Um, I know even my experience, um, you know, the specialist, the ER doctor, the surgeon, all within a week were willing to give me a prescription for 30 days um, and how easy that becomes available. Dr. Morris, you look like you had a question. <clears throat> oh, we'll come back to you, Shane. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Henry Morris. Uh, Dean of Institutional Diversity. Question is on the opiate again. And it's one of those political realities, uh, particularly in some of the communities I work with. What makes a drug worthy of rehabilitation versus incarceration in, in terms of your studies that you do? Because some people would argue some, some of these, when you get addicted to something, you get put in jail. Yep. Other things now we're trying to rehabilitate people. And it, some people argue there's some Noticeable differences of why we choose, but in terms of your studies and oh things, goodness. have you noticed those kind of differences? And Absolutely. So basically what we find is that the drugs that people incarcer are incarcerated for is that the, the drugs that the people of, in power aren't using. And that's what we found at the turn of the century, all drugs were legal from opium to alcohol to cocaine were completely legal. Um, and that in 1914 is when, you know, it's not 50 year old housewives having little opium anymore. It's Chinese who, were, who came to build our railroads. That's when we started becoming wary of it. And that's what we're finding is just this huge disparity in different populations. 1986, they came up with the Rockefeller laws. They said, you know what, if we punish offenders, we give them five years, five to 20 years for a simple possession. And that's where the rates of African American men, African -American men Hispanic men, filled up our prisons because that's where they were ticketing people. Um, so, and that's, that's another interesting thing with the opioid epidemic is that all of a sudden, it, it stinks because it's when it's you know upper middle class white kids who are overdosing on heroin. That's when there's a huge response. The crack epidemic, meth epidemic, we don't really talk about, uh, but there's been kind of some contention because it's you know it's not lower income people, and that's where the you know the the government responds when it's like I said, upper middle class white kids. So, so the other thing with our symposium that we just want to expand, we want to make it an addiction symposium overall, not just for opioids, because again, there's some, yeah, there's still some kind of racial disparities there. So you're absolutely right. Thank you. Now Shane. Uh, Shane Boyer with the College of Business. Uh, this is gonna go back to Dave and opening uh, when you talked about TPP and NAFTA. So do you see the uh, opening up of new markets, if, if this does go through, opening of new markets, or is it gonna be a reduction in output? Uh, I know the margins probably aren't there now to keep at the same pace, but uh, just to kind of comment on on, uh, on the export uh, aspects of those, of those bills. Um, really good question, and I partly said it tongue in cheek, and partly very seriously. Is it kind of? It really depends on the week. Okay. Um, you know, we knew coming into no matter what was going to happen with the, the presidential election, we were in a position where neither candidate was in favor of TPP. 
okay, Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, which is 11 other countries. Those 11 other countries have decided to keep forging on, have negotiated the whole deal out, and they're just waiting now for, there are four of those countries that need to have that deal go in front of, you know, their equivalent of like a parliament or Congress or that sort of thing and get it approved. And it's going to move forward. Um, it, it, I don't think it's ever necessarily too late to get in, um, but, but in essence it probably may be at this point. Okay? So the administration has said that instead of doing these multilateral deals, all that means is just multiple countries at once, they're much more interested in doing bilaterals. So for example, I mean, we do have a trade agreement with Japan. So remember Japan was one of those lists, that, one of those countries that was on our top export list. Um, but it's not, it doesn't give us complete access. Okay, so we can go up to so many pounds of product, and then after we go over that pounds, then there is a there is a tariff or a duty that goes on in order to partially protect their domestic industry. And so, uh, you know, one of the things that if we would have been in TPP, okay, and Japan is a TPP country, that would have went away. Okay, so it made us more competitive there. So really, our next choice then with Japan is to just do a bilateral. So you try and sit down and work out your own deal with Japan. Um, and so we had the, you know, the Japanese prime minister was playing golf here in the U.S. last week at a certain resort, and so we hope that some of those things end up occurring or those discussions occur. And so, and we're continue to encourage the administration. It's like well, we've got a whole laundry list of countries that that block our product or certain other agricultural products from um, from export. And so, you know, if we're gonna do bilaterals, great, then let's, but then let's get to it, you know? And uh, so I think that's where we're gonna probably end up going. Um, you know, NAFTA I mentioned would be extremely important. It sounds like the odds are very good at this point. There may even come up with an agreement as soon as within the next couple of weeks. And from our standpoint, all we wanna do is keep what we have, okay? And because if you look at growth, you know, because part of it is all right, the whole business thing, right? Keep the customers you have, you know, before going out and getting other ones. So if we look at, at growth, and it just is really because of just the economy in Mexico, which is just getting, they've just got more disposable income, um, is that um, the, the year over year growth in pork production, or in pork consumption, excuse me, in Mexico per person is running about seven to eight percent more year over year, okay? So that's just growth from a country that's got a lot of population to start with. So I think kind of a combination, grow our existing ones, encourage the U.S. to get moving with these bilaterals and trying to break into countries that we don't necessarily have very good access to right now. I mean, is, yeah, because it's, it's gonna be difficult. I mean, the, the Chinese thing is, you know, it, it depressed hog prices here, okay? It took us from basically a net you know, projecting that we would have a net profit for the coming year to a small net loss. Okay, so it did have an effect. Um, we're just gonna have to work on other other ways to go about it to moving product and hopefully we can. Thank you. Uh, good morning, I'm Tim Adams. I'm the Military and Veteran Student Success Coordinator here. And uh, first, I have, I have two questions. First, for Dr. Longren, is there a difference in the treatment modality and the success rates that they have at, say, five-year, ten-year points for veterans who have alcohol or opioid problems? And, of course, that's a, a large problem in the returning veteran population. And for Dr. Mackey, could you look at the... Uh, the distinction between veterans in the rural community and their treatment for mental health and the overall data that you've looked at. Could you break out a little bit for us as the veteran population is seeking mental health and dealing with alcohol and uh, opioid issues as well, does that impact the overall ability for people seeking treatment? Sure. <clears throat> Last week I had a Rule 25 assessor come to my class in assessment and she said that veterans in our community are the most underserved population of anyone. Um, so, so I think that there's still a big stigma within veterans with mental health and addiction. You know, my colleague that is an active duty veteran and when he came back from active duty they showed him a video of the horse whisperer and said, and gave him a a prescription for opioids and said, okay, go back into the community. Um, and I think we're really trying to expand the services, but I think that just 
kind of veteran specific opioid and alcohol addiction services just aren't there, not in our community right now. Um, so hopefully we'll expand that. Um, but yeah, we're just not, we're not um, filling that demand. Jennifer, is it that they're, it's not covered under um, the benefits that they receive after they get out of the military or there just aren't physically providers here in the community or maybe could you, when you say there's, they're not available, explain that a little further. I think it's mostly just providers who don't have the expertise. Um, you know, there's a lot of talk of, you know, veteran mental health providers versus civilian mental health providers. They just might not understand that experience. Um, and I just don't think that there's, there's enough services, there's not enough veterans. I have four veterans in my program right now, so they're getting kind of a good knowledge of addiction and mental health issues, and several of them want to work for the VA and kind of give back. So hopefully that movement will continue, but right now I just don't think we have enough people, you know, to work with that population who have that expertise. Paul? Um, <clears throat> Yeah, actually, uh, uh, as Tim knows, I've done quite a bit of work on this over the years. And uh, uh, it, first of all, veterans, of course, uh, are going to be much more dependent. They're going to be a lot more dependent than non-veteran on VA services, obviously, because it's a, it's a particular selected group. But veterans are highly dependent on VA health care services to be able to receive health care and behavioral health care services. Those who live in rural areas are automatically geographically going to be limited in access to, to services. Uh, that has improved over time, but the places where they can access behavioral health care, be it for uh, drug or alcohol or TBI or uh, uh, PTSD, which are, pro I think those are going to be the big three right now. Uh, because they don't have geographic access, they typically go without because they won't necessarily have a secondary provider for insurance to fall back on. Or if they do, that's where they're accessing it. Uh, the VA has done a better job uh, over the past several years to try to respond to this. But one of the great challenges ultimately boils down to the further that a veteran lives away from a VA uh, provider facility, the harder it's going to be for them to receive services. And I know that the VA can continues to work on that problem. So um, I guess that's, it's, th there's, there's, no, there's no good answer yet. We're, we're, I know the VA is using telecommunications uh, technology and whatnot, but again, we get back to the broadband problem in rural America. So it's, it, it, there's not a good answer right now. Let me uh, pop a question out there. Um, Dave, you said that one of the top three reasons why there's growing demand for pork um, around the world is because of our food safety and the reputation for our food safety. Now, if any of us are listening to the news at home, even just this weekend, throw out any romaine lettuce, don't even check where it is, just get rid of it, don't eat it. Um, and so sometimes the popular media would lead us to believe that our food is not so safe. Could you talk a little bit more about our food safety and maybe in particular some of the things that you were sharing that Minnesota sort of pork does about around food safety? Sure. Um, first of all, uh, I think that all farmers, I mean, if, if they, I think they do really realize and appreciate just the, if you don't have public confidence in the safety of the product that you're producing on the farm, that your, your future is going to be pretty limited, okay? Because no matter what it costs, if people aren't confident in the safety of it, they're not going to purchase your product. Um, you know, the one of the things that, and I'll give the, the pork industry and pork producers credit, is that they were one of the first groups actually out there to adopt um, basically continuing education programs and certification programs and um, and do that, first of all, voluntarily, but then also work with packers so the people were selling pigs too, to actually have those things be required through the marketplace. Um, so it's not a government requirement, you know, that farmers do this um, continuing education and certification programs, but it's really almost better because no one will buy your pigs if you don't do it, okay? And so you don't have some of the, um, sometimes the overhead that comes on the government side of things by having it, um, but yet the marketplace says, you're not gonna, you're not going to have a place to sell them if you don't do these things. 
And the other thing is that, um, and yes, we've got you know the romaine lettuce scare now, and and um, and there. Different one every week. It's romaine this yep. week, so. And I think part of it's just plain communications. You know, just the. Speed speed of communication now and how things move and how information moves. Um, but I'd argue that our food safety today um, is better than it was five years ago, is better than it was 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and so on. Um, I think a couple of things, you know, we can obviously detect things at much different levels that we could even five or 10 years ago. We're looking for more things. Um, you know, and then the other thing though too is even with our um, with all of that being said, there's still not a better place in the world to produce food than right here. You know, and I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, part of the reason why especially many developing countries want to get food from the United States is that there's about as close to absolute confidence in the food safety side of it as anyone else they're dealing with, including a better reputation here in the U.S. for food safety than the European Union has. Okay. There have been more things that have happened um, with some of the European Union food than we've seen here in the United States. You know, so that's one of the things as we look at things as far as Congress and, and so on is that one of the places where we make sure that we never want to skimp on is really that, that oversight that comes with USDA and FDA and so on on the food safety side of things because that would jeopardize our, our reputation and, and it's going to jeopardize our ability to, to sell food. So it's, and it's been a well-earned thing over an long, off long period of time and we just don't want to mess that up. One of the areas, uh, one of the purposes of our colloquium series has been to discover what new areas we might emerge as a university as well as to better tell the story of what we're doing well. And perhaps many individuals don't know that we have a dietetics program here at the university that consistently year after year has a higher place rate uh, for students in the inter residency programs necessary to get uh, the registered dietitian and has a very high above 90% first time pass rate on that dietetics exam. Uh, this year we have 100 percent match rate on dietetics residencies. Uh, we also have a food science technology uh, degree program as well. I see, um, I think Jean, you hadn't asked a question yet, and then if we have time, Henry had another question. Thank you. Um, Lauren, congratulations. A uh, sixth generation farm is getting to be pretty unique. And with that, I'm just curious, would you be willing to share a little bit of where maybe your family had to make some decisions just because if you were going to remain a family farm, you needed to adjust, and maybe where some decisions were made that were innovative, or you thought proactively as a family about what and how to do a family farm so that it could be sustainable. No, absolutely. Um, actually, on the way in here, Dave and I were talking about it just a little bit. <clears throat> I met Dave in 2008, and uh, but back in 2008, there was a, a kind of blew up. A, I don't know if anybody remembers the naming of the swine flu at that time, and that had a very negative impact on the uh, on the hog market at the time. <clears throat> Excuse me. And uh, at that time, my family we raised we we raised quite a few hogs of our own. Now. The pictures I was showing you, we, we contract finish, or feed, we feed for another farm. Um, but essentially at that time we were, uh, just openly say, you know, we were, we were feeding about 35,000 hogs a year. And for nearly two years, um, because of things that happened in the market, stuff like that, um, we were losing about $20 a hog on everyone we marketed. Um, it's not very sustainable financially to be able to do that. And it was a lot easier for me to make these decisions because I hadn't been around it nearly as long as my dad had. Um, for my dad to be okay with the decision to give up the ownership of, of raising pigs himself to feed for somebody else, uh, that was tremendously hard for him. And I can still remember sitting around the supper table that night and dad started our, uh, he started our meeting off with prayer and he just said, you know, you don't, you know, I'm not asking you for you to save us. I'm just asking you to guide us as we do what we need to do. And we made that decision and we moved forward. And ultimately, um, 
you know, looking back on had we continued to feed our own hogs, I think that would have been the end of our farm at that time because it didn't correct itself as quickly as what we thought it may. And we, we thought about continuing on, but we decided to change there. And then beyond that, um, Again, I'm kind of looking at the, um, you know, the financial end of it because it's it's a huge factor. Um, but when I talked about the forage harvesting part of it, that was a group that that we in, we invested into to be a part of that group, and it's been very successful that way. Um, and so, those are a couple of the decisions we've made in recent history, um, you know, to to make sure that that we would be there, you know, for the next generation, um, and. Real quick, I mean, I can even, the stories I've heard from the generation before, uh, my grandfather, he was, uh, uh, he had polio in 1955 and never walked again. My dad never saw his own dad walk. And my grandma had had the conversation with her three boys who were, they, they waited a few years, but they were 10, 9, and 4. And she asked them if they thought that they could run the family farm at that time. And so they, they changed what they had been doing. They, uh, they decided that they were going to get big into chickens at the time and raised, I mean, they were selling eggs and whatnot. And yes, at that time, that is what kept the family going and taking care of medical bills. So there's, there's been many times. These are just a, a few of the examples of decisions we've had to make to, to make sure that we're going to be there for the next generation. Thank you. I think, um, Henry, I think we might have time for one more question. Non-political question. How much of the acreage in, in Minnesota is family-owned versus big ag businesses? Just curious. I honestly don't know if I can give you a number on that. There again, it's it's an interpretation. You know, what uh, if this farm is this size? You know, do people say that's a family farm? You know, is it? I don't think there's any real good way to quantify that as far as how many majority of the land nearly is. I mean, majority of the land is family farms. Yet, uh, very very little of it is is in the corporate. Um, how would I say that the 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 corporate farm? And I don't want to get too far in the weeds on this either. But a lot of the you might see, for instance, our farm is Molinar Farms LLC, and it was designed that way for insurance reasons to be a limited liability company. And so when you see some of these things where maybe it says Inc. or something like that, it's quite possibly a family, but it might be the way their business was designed just as a means of doing business. Dave, you wanted to respond to that? Sure. So we actually, Minnesota is a little unique. We have something called a corporate farm law in Minnesota um, that it's got a long history, but it, in essence what it means is that um, a, a publicly traded company okay, can't own farmland in Minnesota. And so just like you said, though, we have a lot of farms, in fact, many of them, family owned, but maybe as an LLC or a, or a C Corp or S Corp. Um, that's very, very common. No different than family owned Main Street stores that we would see here in Mankato. Um, so it, the only exception to that, okay, and there is one, and that is for poultry farms. So in Minnesota, if you raise turkeys or chickens or eggs, you're exempt from our corporate farm law. And the reason for that predates me, and, but um, the reason for that really is that when tweaks along the way were made to the state's corporate farm law is that the, by and large, the turkey and egg industry was already in, quote, larger corporate hands. So instead of basically forcing divestiture, they just said, all right, you're exempt from it. But otherwise, there is, again, we're unique that way. There's only about four or five states that are like that. Um, that does put limitations on who can actually own uh, farmland. We also, it's illegal, no matter how you're set up, um, to have foreign ownership of Minnesota farmland. Um, so, again, that's a little unique to Minnesota, too. Okay. Can I make one more comment on that, too? Sure. The most recent statistic that I saw was that 98% of all farms are still family farms. 
Thank you. Well, we've come to our time, so I certainly want to thank our panelists for today. I know throughout this year, I personally have learned so much uh, through the panelists, and I also would like to thank the audience. We were a little light on students today, but it's our last week of classes, so they're crunching with exams and studying and so forth. But um, from all the questions that our audiences have asked that have helped to um, guide our panelists in sharing their expertise, I really appreciate. As I've said, we never ran short because there was a lack of questions for discussion. Um, as a small token of appreciation for our panelists today, uh, we want you to be Minnesota State Mankato proud. So we have a small token of our appreciation for your uh, time and expertise. We hope this is just the beginning of a longer relationship as we deepen and broaden our work in ag, food, and natural resources across all of our majors and programs and colleges. Um, we're going to take some time at the end of this year to reflect, to gather people again, to help us uh, determine what those next steps will be as we enter a new academic year, but we know that all of you will be good partners in that. Let me also remind you once again on May 1st, you will hear students presenting. We've not had students on our panel this year speak about um, the issues of food insecurity and hunger, even amongst our own university students. And that'll be a very enlightening uh, presentation at that time. One of the other areas of distinction that we have really showcased throughout this year is health and biomedical sciences. And we had our first health and biomedical sciences summit about a month ago, but aligned with that, one of the prestigious lectures on our campus is the Douglas R. Moore Research Lectureship. And I'll take this opportunity to put in a plug at 7 p.m. this evening in this very auditorium. We will have one of our, our um, 2018 Douglas R. Moore Research Lectureship recipients. That was a mouthful. Uh, Dr. Kuldeep Agarwal will be talking about um, 3D printing and the future of um, health and medicine, particularly looking at some bone regeneration and how that makes um, things like your artificial hips feel better. So I, I plan to be here personally as well. Um, we do have some light refreshments in the back of the room if you would like to stay and speak with each other, you liked each other's questions or with our panelists. And we also, I if we have any members in the audience who paid in the pay lot, we'll provide a parking pass for you. I think some of them bugged out earlier to get to other meetings. But once again, thank you so very much uh, for a successful year with our We Have Ag Colloquium series. Thank you.